at oh the sound or, button, maybe um the share sound yeah yeah Okay. Um, so as David mentioned, I am at NC State. I'm actually the department head of art and design. Um, and within that program, we cover a lot of different things. And I was listening to several of the talks earlier today and definitely interdisciplinary um, work is core to what I do and core to how we operate in our program. Um, I, sorry, disclaimer. I, I'm from I'm in North Carolina, and outside we are blanketed in yellow um, pollen right now. So <laughs> if I have to take a sip or I'm a little congested, <laughs> I promise you it's not COVID. <laughs> oh my God. But I'm just having one of those pollen full saturation days. So. <laughs> Um, so yes, we're, we're very interdisciplinary. Even in our department, we cover gaming and interaction, animation, um, and a lot of other disciplines just within our college, but then even moving outside of our college. <coughs> um, the work that I have been doing, like, like many of you, involves collaborations, architects and photographers, historians, and a lot of different people. So. I was going to share a bulk of some of the projects that I've been working on, really focusing the big one on that I think I learned the most on. And, and I can't believe next year will be 10 years since I got my first um, Oculus Rift DK1. And it seems like it's been longer um, in my life, but that's just how fast time has changed. And in the decade, um, I remember getting that headset <clears throat> and thinking, I can't go back. Um, there's just no turning back. Whatever my future is going to be, I'm going to be working in VR, in mixed reality, in this space. And so, like some of you, some of the first projects were about recreating architectural buildings, looking at history. But over the last couple of years, I've been really kind of asking myself, how can we go beyond, you know? If, if stage one of VR was about just recreating spaces, and that was for me, I'm now trying to look at what does it mean to recreate a moment? And that definitely requires us to look at emotional states. It requires us to think about people on a human scale, you know, not on this kind of overarching um, data blueprints, who was, just information rather. Who was there? Checkbox. What were the dimensions of these buildings? Checkbox. You know, we're at a pretty good point in time right now where we could get data about moments in time, places in time, and recreate it. But if we want to dig a little bit deeper, it requires us to personally dig deeper in storytelling. You know, when we start thinking about um, how information is shared and how it was shared historically, you know, you think about the moments of Dr. King right before he was assassinated. I, I break it down to reminding myself, and it's hard to because we live in such a society of mobile phones, that even though there were photographers on the site that captured this moment right here of his leaders in the room thinking, talking about it, these photos didn't come out for, for weeks later. <laughs> You know, these guys, we, we live in an Instagram society where information just pops up instantly. So, well, how was the story told? Well, they told it to each other, right? They, they passed it around orally. They, they communicated. And there's something about, I could imagine telling these men going home, talking to their wives, talking to their children, telling them with the grief in their voice what just happened. And I think for me, that's really the future of jumping into some of these historical VR projects. It goes much deeper than recreating data spatially, recreating these things visually, audibly. We, these are all great for st um, stabs at it. But I'm looking to see how can we grab into this emotional aspect of telling stories. And definitely the spatial embodiment is a part of it. Museums have been doing this for a while now. This is the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis that I partnered with when I did the I'm a Man VR project. It was funded predominantly by Oculus, but also I had partnership with the museum. 
And when the first time I visited the museum, um, because they kept in intact the Lorraine Motel, as you see here in the in the image, I couldn't help the emotions that were overflowing on top of me just getting out of my car and walking up the street here. It was a hot day and I was just like, that is the space. That is where he was shot. And on top of that, if you were to go to the site, you would see that they also, they also kept the space where the shooter took the shot. And so they get this very eerie, spatial, not even a recreation, it's the real space where you look across the alley and you see the apartment building and then you see the balcony spot and you're moved, you're moved emotionally. Um, when you go through the museum, the spatial recreation using full scale figures, some abstracted like you see here in the photo, um, really begins to take you on a journey. And if I was to measure any success for myself in the work that I do, it's the journey. I measure it by the journey. What journey am I taking you on? What emotional journey am I taking you on? How are you moved? How are you touched? Are you, are you physically crying? Are you physically moved? Do you come out wanting to have a deeper connection with this moment in time and talk with people? And so this has been my, my process of really saying, how do we move beyond the photo? How, how do we move into these emotional ways of storytelling, but then leverage the spatial component of it to do this. Now for me, this first project that I did, I'm a man, was I, I benefited from the space being there kept. The Lorraine Motel um, room 306 is still intact if you were to go there today. It's behind glass, but they still have it perfectly staged. And so that was my personal ground zero. Having been to the museum, having been to these spaces, my first step was just to go into, in this project, I used the Unreal Game Engine to say, you know, if I recreate everything material-wise, these, these, these steps, what do I feel about being in the space? Because remember, at the museum, it's behind glass. So this was the first time that I could actually be in Dr. King's room. And I immediately noticed that even with it fully rendered, there was something still lifeless about it. And I needed to really start thinking about the interaction who was I in the space? At this time, when I created this, there, I did not have touch controllers. Um, I started the project before, before Oculus even released those controllers. And so it was like an Xbox um, controller that we had just to, that, just to look around. And things are kind of happening in real time for me. Um, but then I said, you know, this has to come to life. So I put some old footage on a television. I dropped an avatar that I created of Dr. King in the space. and these scenes never made it um, to the full VR project, but they're important for me. They're important for me as a developer because what I was able to do was to sit in the space and really reflect on Dr. King like a, an ordinary human being on a road trip, away, um, tired, fatigued, hotel room. You know, before COVID, I know what it's like to travel. I know about being out there away from family and I just wanted to start thinking about how do we begin to capture those subtleties of the human experience in these spaces and bring them to life. All of this came together when I really started digging deeper in the touch controllers and dealing with embodiment. I was really excited when um, Oculus, when they, and this is like years ago when they released those touch controllers, um, I had done some previous experiments before with a um, leap motion headset where it's, you could put it on your um, forehead and get finger tracking. It was really bulky, a lot of wires, but I was like, oh, this is the future, you know, the idea of having human hands. But I didn't realize how impactful this would be for storytelling when I intentionally designed the ethnicity of the hand based upon the story that's being told. And I've seen people come out of this experience just really blown away because they have a black man's hands. Like just like letting that sink in. And I've since done several experiments just to see how far this goes for myself. I mean, for me, I have black hands, so I didn't have that major aha moment. And also as a black gamer, I'm used to playing in the role of the avatars of white males all the time. That's another lecture for another day. But for a lot of people, this is the first time they've done a VR or a game in general where they're embodied a, a black human being. And so 
I, this is this was a great discovery of what we can do and what we will do in the future with being able to give people a sense of empathy by saying, you know, become a woman, become the elderly, become a child, become black, become these things outside of yourself. And, and what's great about this is like, there's no escaping. You know, when you watch a film, you can always kind of look away or there's this kind of screen dis distance between what you're watching and who you are sitting on the couch in a movie theater. But there is something really unique about VR saying, I have to ask my questions, what is it like to be this ethnicity, this gender, this person in this time and space? And it's something that I encourage all designers to really start thinking about how far we can push this. Um, the other thing that I felt was really important earlier on with this project, because I knew I wanted to take you on a journey through different scenes. And this is kind of like my architecture background kicking in. I knew there had to be a spatial language. Uh, too many times I've seen VR pieces and some of them long where I've been in the same exact spatial environment the whole time. And what I mean here is about the diversity that we can create just generically in space. And when I create a VR project, even if I'm a man, I always think about these as what are the possible moves I can take. Now, I do understand it's very challenging if you have a historical context. It's like, okay, it's very enclosed. I worked on a project with um, a, um, a humanities grant um, from the NEH and with another colleague. And it was the recreation of a church that Dr. King spoke in, 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 in um, a church he spoke in in Durham, North Carolina that no longer exists. What's interesting is even though we knew we were gonna be in that church the whole time, earlier on I said, we have to change our point of views. And so it was about being on the balcony. It was about being up front. And the, the co-investigator, she was very interested in spatial audio. So she was, she was already on board of like, how do we bounce sound around? How did King sound like in the back of a crowd? How did he sound out on the balcony? And so while she was thinking about audio pushing that, I was thinking about the visual diversity. I'm like, I can't, I just don't wanna sit in the pew the whole time and watch it. So projects like these really require you to think about what is the spatial rhythm that you're moving through, whether you're in an open space, whether you're in a tight and closed space and alleys. And this is, this is what I call this, like my playbook. What are the spaces? And when you think about creating a, a virtual environment that's long, right? Like 20 minutes long or something like that, you really have to keep it moving, keep the diversity um, going for space. Uh, some of the projects I see that are done commercially, people are doing that. The Vader Immortal series I think about. I think about um, some of these commercial projects, Half-Life Alex. These are projects that are, they're switching up the light, they're switching up the spatial conditions, and it keeps you moving and keeps you engaged. Um, but I think another layer on that is to really consider the, the, the metaphors that are embedded in these types of spaces. What does it mean to feel on top of a mountain? Optimism. What does it feel like to be in a sense of sorrow? Tight alleyways. And so we think about these spatial conditions also as potential things where we can map um, our targeted emotions. So if you put these things together, you're beginning to create a little formula for yourself. You have a spatial condition, you have lighting conditions, you have sound conditions, and you think about the targeted emotions and where you want to take people on the journey. And that's how you snap those pieces together. For my project, I'm a man, I just had the photographs and I wasn't following a historical narrative. I knew about the, um, the Memphis annotation workers. I followed these things, but then I said, you know, what, are, what, are, what do I call these scene names? This is, this is like designing a stage play in a lot of ways or designing a film. And so, you know, I called the first scene, the alley of despair and the humble home, the protest march. Like these are just themes that are labels for me that then I could build, right? What's my targeted emotion and then build the spatial quality and just evaluate it on this level um, in my mind before I begin to build out the whole experience and also make sure I'm taking you on a nice trajectory and a nice arc. So um, for, for those who've never tried it or seen it, the scene does start off with um, being in an alleyway, being in, um, you are actually a sanitation worker and you begin to take out the garbage on a morning routine. Um, the sanitation worker strike actually started because two men were escaping the rain and they, one, they were sitting on the back of the truck escaping the rain on a cold day and there was a malfunction on the truck, pulled one of the men and crushed him. He passed away and then the city just told the family, we're sorry that happens. There was no severance package. There was nothing. 
And these men had nothing. I'm talking about years of service, no retirement, and there's nothing set up for them. Even for something like a, a terminally ill, if you're sick, no sick days, um, no cold days. And they were, it, they were treated horrible, horrible working conditions. And that's frankly why Dr. King went there in the first place, because he was on the poor people's campaign at this month, at this point in his life. And so dealing with poverty and, you know, what, there's something about this first scene that, um, if you were to play it, you'll notice that the, the everything is dynamic. The trash can is dynamic. You grab it. If you spill the trash on the ground, it spills everywhere. And I just love watching people go through this project. They're like, oh, 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 I spilled all the trash. Oh, oh, and they're getting down on the ground. They're literally picking it up. And it begins to put things in context about what would it mean to work 40, 50 hour weeks doing this type of labor and still um, being able to be on welfare because you're not making enough. That's the conditions that these men were working on under. Um, this idea of picking objects up is really important. It connects to um, what Sherry Turkle calls evocative objects. You know, these things that we can, we, just the interaction of grabbing things and touching things that make them come to life. And that's something that the museums are really interested in for VR for the future, because think about most of their artifacts that sit behind glass for good reasons. You can't touch and interact with these things. But as soon as we take a newspaper clipping that might have been behind glass in a museum or framed in a certain way, and you can actually pick it up as you do in this scene, you connect with it on that human level, on that human scale. And it wasn't just things like the newspaper or things in these homes like this. There are even moments where you pick up the sign. I thought that because I'm a man the black and white photo of these men walking is so iconic. I made sure that this sat in the middle of my VR experience. Like, this is the story, this is the, the high part. And there were some interesting, challenging things I had to do earlier on that you'll see that I don't have to do anymore in my lighter project, Barnstormers, um, that we'll talk about in a little bit. But earlier on, I was really fighting against the uncanny valley of avatars. How do I deal with photorealism in a scene and still deal with like the wooden, lifeless, faceless expressions that digital avatars often give us? Uh, in this case, I chose the silo pseudo silhouette portion, really putting the shadow and thinking about the lighting of the street. Um, the men are mostly in dark. If you're in VR, they really do come across like pseudo silhouettes. And you don't have that scenario in which you see the blank stare of a, of a digital avatar. And it seemed to work really well. Obviously, when you're a further away from characters, you can do so much more and they seem a little bit more lifelike. And for some of the people who visited, who, who tried this experience, in a lot of ways, this made the hair on their necks um, stand up because not only are, am I in the full recreation of the Lorraine Motel um, with the swimming pool that's no longer there on site, that it was recreated there. Um, the significance of a swimming pool, um, the museum was so excited that I put that element in there from those photos because remember during this time, um, black people were still traveling with the green book. They were still trying, traveling with the guide that gave them, this hotel is safe for you to stay in, and this hotel is not safe, and they won't let you in here. In the Lorraine, Lorraine Motel, with an in-ground swimming pool in Memphis, was high class. And Dr. King was staying in one of the best hotels in the area. Um, and so the, even thinking about the economics of spaces and thinking about what they meant in certain periods of time, these things are important. But back to the avatar, for those who knew the history when you're there, you know it's about to happen. King's on the balcony, your hair stands up on the back of your neck, there's a song playing on the background. And in my early iterations of this project, I went for it and I saw the whole thing and I programmed the whole thing. On top of that, I programmed it in a way where you couldn't predict when the shot would happen and the shot would just happen and take you off guard. Now this was almost four years ago um, three years ago, three and a half years ago. And at that time I said, we're not ready yet to see this type of recreation history. So I faded it out to black and it fades out to black. And just when a scene goes dark, like a theater, you hear the shot right behind you spatially and you understand what happened without graphically visually showing you what happened. Um, three years later, I still feel the same way. 
I still not think we're ready to put on a VR headset and go to concentration camps and see lynchings and see some of the horrific things that have happened through history. That's my personal take. Um, others may disagree with me, but I still think there is more artistry that we could do, more abstraction um, that we can do to give you those emotional states without putting you in the visual graphic horror of those things. Um, one of the things this last year has made me think a lot about is dissemination and the challenges. Clearly, COVID crippled a lot of us who were using conferences and live spaces to show VR content. And even before COVID shut all that down, there were still always a lot of challenges about how do you get people in headsets? How do you bring them out? How long should a piece be? Um, currently, I, um, I uh, a few months ago was announced that I am the chair for the Immersive Pavilion at Seagraph for 2022. And even working with that community for 2021, we have so many conversations about the public place of VR XR. Like, how do we do it in a way that's meaningful? Um, I learned some of it the hard way. We took the VR piece. I had some students with me that we went to Memphis at the 50th anniversary and we put up a kiosk and allowed people to put the headset on, um, people native to Memphis, and um, <coughs> they were able to, to see I'm a man right there. And that was very surreal because they're in the headset, they're at the Lorraine Motel, and they're out of the headset and they look over there and they're like, that's Lorraine Motel. And so these are people who knew the streets, they knew the area, and I still think there's a beautiful place for VR to exist in museums and exist in actual locations where stuff happened um, we're still struggling to get back to those, those spaces and those places. Um, but then even disseminating things online, when you have work like this, you're going to get wide responses. My work, um, I don't keep it in a very closed container that's, some projects I do, very academic, closed container. You know, you have to come to the university to see it or it's at a conference. With I'm a Man, I released it on the Oculus Store as part of the conditions that uh, Facebook gave me funding. And man, what a learning experience. Within the first week, someone called it a liberal agenda to promote racism and to exasperate the history of Blacks in America. Now, while that angered me, I was like, what are you talking about? Um, what I did appreciate and made me have conversations with my colleagues about the dissemination of our work sometimes only being stuck in the ivy t ivory tower. I'm like, we should be sharing our projects with the general public. They should be engaged with history in this way. And, but to do so, that requires us to, one, we have to have some thick skin. Two, if we're going to disseminate a project broadly that way, that means the quality and the craft has to step up. There is no one that's in the, in the general public that's gonna say, oh, I forgive this project because it's an academic one. And that's the dirty little secret that we often see sometimes for us that we're like, oh, well, this is not a commercial project. You know, we don't do that with other things. You don't do that with a book, right? You don't look at a book and say, oh, a faculty a professor wrote that, so we'll just give it a pass. No, in the literary works, the same whether I'm in, uh, I am in a university or not, it has the same quality. I would say where we are now with documentaries are the same thing. The, um, in, right here in the Research Triangle, Duke University has a great documentary um, program for historians. And when you look at the work that's being done by people in that space, there's not that much differentiation between the academic work and the, the, the documentary that I would see on Netflix or HBO. So why do we say the same thing with VR and with games? And, I, and that's always my challenge to other developers that we should dig in all together dig in, keep digging in on your quality, keep digging on the project. So at the end of the day, I, the one thing I was happy that with all the comments that people said about it, no one said, oh, it looks bad or it felt bad. And, and for me, that was like, I can take someone calling it a, a liberal agenda, but I couldn't take someone saying the graphics are horrible. And so as a result, I was encouraged and I was able to send this out to a lot of more traditional film festivals. And it's just allowing academics to disseminate our work when we put the work in to get that craft at that high level, we'll get a broader audience engaged with our work. Now, sometimes that broadness will open up to unexpected um, uses of it. 
I was not expecting the email I got one day that said, hey, we're using I am a man to foster conversations between police and communities. And I was like, say what? <laughs> I, I did not design it that way. Um, but as we all know, VR has been put in this space of empathy for a while. Chris Milt fam famously called it VR as an empathy machine. And while I personally disagree with the word machine, the subtlety of that word suggests that it's an automated in an experience, hey, I'm a racist, I put on a VR headset, VR healed me, and I come out and I love everyone. And it doesn't really work that way. And so I love this idea that it's a tool, right? Because a tool implies that you have to do some work. I have to do some work. If I really want to change my perspectives on some things, I can use VR as a mechanism to, to show me something different, but I still have to be receptive I still have to let those messages come in. And then it's what I do about the world when I come out. And so I was able to work with a nonprofit called Equality Labs, who took my project, I'm a Man, and set it right beside a project called Dispatch, which is done by another group. And what they did is they set a curriculum where police members would go through I'm a Man, and students or community people would go through Dispatch. Dispatch took you on a journey of what it's like to be called from a 911 call, completely blind, not knowing what's, what's going on at the site and just listening to the audio cues and trying to make sense. And so what we found, what we found is that when people were, were coming out of the both, ex, of both experiences, that they were for the first time having a sense of what the other person's worldview was. And so just by moving the dial there, I was able to take um, Raleigh's, um, Raleigh, North Carolina's leadership, police leadership team all through I'm a Man at our lab at NC State. And one of the things that kept coming out when they were officer after officer was coming out of the headset, going through the I'm a Man experience, they kept talking about, man, this is about building trust, building trust. If we, we are constantly trying to tell community members, we understand understand your worldview, we understand your wealth. And he's like, we need more projects like this, more projects to open up our eyes to the history of racism in America, or the history of the problems in our community. And it's just about building this trust. And you know, one officer told me, he's like, frankly, you know, we have officers who've never just been around people of color and been at a barbershop or been um, at a cookout. And so even VR being a space to kind of saturate yourself and be around other communities, and obviously I'm a man, it's much deeper. It transforms you into being a black man. There is something about this as a tool that can then help communities that build these conversations and do these things. Once again, completely unexpected, but something that just came my way. So take all of that that I just said about I'm a Man, this project that deals with the civil rights, that deals with the struggle, that deals with empathy, and all of a sudden I turned my page and I'm dealing with something um, somewhat related, but I like to think of it as a different spectrum, and that's Barnstormers. Um, the, the, the company Logic Grip, I didn't mention at the beginning, is um, the, the, the startup company that was spun out of NC State for my lab. And so I do have a commercial arm um, that NC State allows me to work with companies and commercialize products. And you'll see a little bit about that later. But for me, when I first started thinking about the Negro League Baseball, my initial thought was, oh, let's talk about baseball players and their struggle to play during times of segregation. And the more I dug deep into the story and um, with this project, I have partnered with the Negro League Baseball Museum in Kansas City. And it was my trip to Kansas City and talking with Mr. Bob Kendrick, the director there, I realized that is not the story I'm going to tell. This is not a story about struggle, a struggle and the racism. I mean, that's there. It's going to be there. But no, this is a story about heroism. This is a story about pride, proud black men playing a game better than their counterparts. And that is something that I was like, wow, this is a really interesting approach to, to talk about during a time of struggle. Um, being those who are conquering the odds, those who are playing games that they love. And, and, and just even I was learning about the economics of Negro League Baseball and how we had black owners and the hotels that supported those and the food vendors. And it was a whole system that unfortunately 
Um, and, and Mr. Kendrick would say this, and he says that in his talks, when baseball was integrated, it was a double-edged, it's a double-edged sword. Why one way it does allow black players into the major leagues, but on the other side of it, it gutted a complete economic system. And so I was thinking about, wow, maybe instead of focusing completely on the Jim Crow side of Negro League Baseball, in which, yes, they would play on the field, and when they came off the field, they couldn't go to certain restaurants, maybe it's about highlighting the high life, the highlight of Satchel Paige and Josh Gibson and, and, and being a little bit more celebratory about the work and the game that they played and less about the sorrow and despair. So that became this, this, this way on which I began to think about this project. Like several others, it does start with looking at some of the spaces that we could tell the story through. Some of the stadiums don't exist anymore. Um, I had two graduate students that I did some early work with and I put them on assignments and they started pulling up, finding, researching um, blueprints for stadiums and building early models of these things. Uh, I worked with another student <coughs> who um, was really interested in, in working with me and thinking about what's the universe, what's the overarching story here, and thinking about um, th how World War II was something that we discovered was a major component that disrupted the Negro League baseball. That there's this whole era of Negro Leagues, Rube Foster starting at the beginning, World War II somehow disrupts it in the middle, and then it kind of fades off to the south with Jim Crow really on the rise. And the racism, it's, it's really interesting. The closer they got to integration, the worse the conditions were overall in the US. There's something that was, it's almost like it's a breaking point that because this, it, they knew it was coming, there was this like counterforce that was trying to rise up. So there's a lot of interesting things here when we start looking at the overarching storyline. Um, the other thing I want is to look at is how did I really want the VR experience to feel? It's a baseball story after all. And I started thinking about movies I loved about baseball. Even non, even um, fictional movies. The Natural is a fictional movie, but I, that's that has to be one of my favorite sports movies of all time. Um, Soul of the Game is the is the the most comprehensive Negro League baseball movie. Um, that one's actually on YouTube. Um, it was produced by HBO, but they've released it for free. And then we couldn't talk about this without talking about Jackie. Um, 42, great movie by the late um, Chadwick Boseman. But, you know, these are films that tell these stories in beautiful ways. And so when I begin to start getting to my production, which I'm in production on this right now, it's with those movies. And of course, going back to what I said at the very first slide, going beyond the photo. And so you look at these photos, look at these old environments, and you see the kids playing what we still call the great American game, baseball. And there's something about the sound of baseball. There's something about the spirit and the playfulness of it that I said, this project has to capture. It has to capture the play. It's going to be playful. It's going to have to capture the, the lore of it, the, the rags to riches of it. And so in some cases, and earlier on, and we're getting to some slides where this is the first time some uh, I've, I've shown this publicly, are some of my production set photos in which I am thinking about moments where children are embedded in it, and this kind of like sandlot um, kids playing on the ground, really thinking about the characters. Um, one of the things I talked about earlier on with I'm a Man was the limitations that I had in tool sets to really build avatars. And if you saw on some of the, the companies that are helping sponsor this project, one of them is iClone. And iClone is a software suite that's really built just for avatars, but what you can do with it is really magical. On top of that, um, the tool set also allows great optimization for both film and games. So that's my little plug for iClone. They're a really, really great company to work with. Um, but they've opened up for me my storytelling. And my, my characters, they no longer have to hide in the shadows anymore. I can bring them up to light. And, and, and you know, I'm a, I'm a parent. I have a, a daughter and two young boys. And even as I'm, I'm making these, this project, I, I feel just warmth and nostalgia just building these little kids. And we don't, we don't see projects that highlight young black boys just playing and being in 
spaces and being non-threatening. And um, I could go on and on about the insignificance of seeing um, various shades of brown in a positive way just played on video game environments. Um, let me dig a little bit deeper on some of my developer notes here. Um, anyone who's done a gaming or VR project knows one of the most scary things to do with stadiums is to populate them. And in the back of my head, when I, when I said I was going to do Barnstormers, in the back of my head, I just knew there's this big, scary giant back there. It's like, you'll never conquer me, the crowd. Um, there are really good tool sets out there to develop crowds for film. <laughs> but when it comes to game and even optimizing for, for virtual reality, it's really challenging. Um, nonetheless, I'll tell you a little tip in, that I've been playing around with. It's not completely perfect yet, um, but what I've decided to do, it's painstakingly long, is think about developing a suite of characters. That way I can control the attire of the era to make sure they are historically correct, but then render them out in a small atlas map. And by doing that, it's, it's gonna re reduce your draw cause, it brings it down, it's basically just rendering a little texture in a loop and the results, what I've been testing right now in VR, and right now, this is a crowd of 30 unique, no, 20, I think I'm at 26 or 27 unique characters that I have. That's each of them um, modeled, animated, put your, render them out into an atlas map, put them as a texture that loops, and the results are going good so far. I'm constantly checking, checking if their frames are dropping and it is completely reducing time. So that's my little, um, I couldn't find that tip anywhere. I passed that along for those who are doing those Roman Colosseums and those other big projects. Really consider this approach. Um, it's subtle and it gives just enough movement in the crowd that you'd be um, really pleased with in VR. Another thing that's really interesting, and I think I saw someone's project, but it wasn't a VR project, but a man was holding the shovel. And I was like, ha, ah, holding objects with two hands. Painfully awkward in VR. If anyone's ever held a sword, ever held a shovel, you know it doesn't feel correct. Um, one of the things that my lab also does beyond building content is that we play with peripherals and hardware. And this one called the Axe One, uh, allows your Oculus controllers to lock together. Now, even before I was doing Barnstormers, I was testing this out for different applications, Vader Immortal, Swords, um, Baseball. And it's really great that it gives you that sensation that your hands are locked on axis and you're able to swing and hit baseballs and it feels right. And if you don't have this device, you know you're fumbling with your wrist kind of connected and it's a really strange thing. Um, I'm, we're at a crossroads now, right now of my development, where was one part that really enjoys holding baseball bat and swinging with the two hands. Um, I'm also in the midst of testing out what it means to hit the ball and take off running to first base, which is once again, a nightmare to program, but we don't know until you try it. Um, you'll also notice that, um, that there is something unique about how I'm trying to think about this project. Is it a game? Yes. Is it a, a storytelling experience? Yes. You know, I don't want to classify. I want you to be able to do both. I want you to be able to play a game like baseball thematically with music, but also be embedded in history and be able to learn about these characters through real-time interaction right before the scene opened. That was Satchel Page there that was rendered up. And um, just really playing around with the cadence between where's this fine line between something feeling like a game, playing like a game, and then something else um, feeling like an I am a man like VR historical experience. So there's me taking off. <laughs> it's a really, it's a really interesting mechanic. Um, my wife did it once. She's like, I'm not going to play this. I'm exhausted already. Um, but we're playing around with that. So um, obviously thinking about baseball, one half of it is holding a bat and swinging and the other half is using a glove. And what I love about this historical piece, and I, you know, I always look at asset stores, say, hey, what's out there? There's tons of gloves from 1980 and beyond. And I really started looking. I was like, well, wait a second. That's not going to feel right. That's not the Negro League glove. 
um, Turbo Squid, I put this in there as, laughingly because like, there's only one old glove on Turbo Squid. And this person who has it knows that they have the only vintage glove. But just looking at the glove, I, I was excited because potentially that could be an anchoring point of where you are in history. You know, if you have the glove from the 1950s versus the 1920s, that's a visual cue of where you are in time. And so thinking about subtly being able to do these things, position you in place, has definitely um, brought this thing to life. Um, I'll show you this one clip right here. Um, throwing and catching mechanics. Once again, I'm looking for the nostalgia. I'm looking for making it feel right. And so what you'll see in my, in my production art is I do things both. I'll have some files from just working out mechanics, breaking them down, thinking about how things feel, catching and releasing baseballs. Then others, I'm building spaces and building materiality and building characters. So it's the combination of this type of work of, of, of where I'm going. Um, as I mentioned before, I clone a great suite for characters. It really does justice to allow you to build avatars in, in really great ways. And they even have some, some great built-in tools for puppeting faces, right, built into their tool set. And so I'm a big fan of what that's been able to do with this project that I didn't have those tools when I was doing I Am A Man. And then last but not least, um, I'll leave, just leave the last 10 minutes for some questions here. I'm, I'm thinking once again about that dissemination. Where else could we go with this story and, and the projects with it? And so I was able to put one student on a project, a really good just tester. It's like, hey, can you make some cards from the avatars and do a quick AR sample? Not that we're gonna go in this, this route, but I just wanna see what it, what it might do. And um, this was just a quick exercise that he did. And I don't know if we're gonna fully develop them, um, but I think potentially it could, could just be yet, especially if these things get animated, yet another layer of bringing history to life in a rich way. I'll leave you on this teaser um, trailer that we made for the game, and then we'll, I'll be able to answer some Q&A. Well, yeah, I don't there. have any immediate question there, but I just want to all kind of immediately say that both those projects are really impressive and inspiring. And I just want to, I just want to commend you and say that those look just amazing. Um, so great, great work. It's, it's, it's inspiring seeing you talk about it and see all that stuff. So this is, this is really cool stuff. And I'm glad that you uh, took the time to share with us today. Thank you. Yeah, and all super generous for you to, to show us what you showed, things like um, how you think about naming the scenes and the importance of the target emotion that you're going for, the storytelling arc of it. Um, so that kind of generosity, but also the generosity of, man, crowds are a problem. Here's how I'm trying to solve this problem. Because we built this huge, ridiculous game about Rome and crowds were a nonstop, like what, we can't have more than 10 people here at a time. And so that was, that was on that granular level, super cool. And on that high sort of narrative level, also super cool. So like first thing is to say really thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. Yeah, super fun stuff. <laughs> yeah, now's the time to ask those questions if you got them. Um, so yeah, I guess I do have a question. Yeah. Um, so where, where did, where, what's the genesis for these projects? Do you have these ideas and then go 
try to find funding for them or, or do these ideas originate from somewhere and then you pick them up and, um, and run with them? Um, how, can you explain like just how, how that, the genesis of, of these projects begins? Yeah, well, you know, one of the things that I am interested in are the stories that aren't the household names, right? Like we all know Jackie Robinson, right? But no one knows Larry Doby. And let me tell you about Larry Doby. Larry Doby entered the league five months after Jackie Robinson. Five months. Jackie Robinson was the first. Guess what? Larry Doby, he won um, and actually hit a home run in the, in the, in the finals um, and won a championship before Jackie did. We all talk about Jackie. And if you go even deeper, Josh Gibson and Satchel Page were better baseball players than, than Jackie. But Jackie was first and had a whole lot of other political and social reasons of why he was chosen first. So I'm really interested in what people don't know. And as being a black man, I love African-American history, but I love the history that we don't know about or just everyone doesn't know about. And it's just like, man, there's so many rich stories. Similar to with the first project, um, there's so many people who didn't know about both the Poor People's Campaign and um, the, the sanitation workers strike. You know, I, it's, it's embarrassing when you ask some people, it's like, hey, how was Dr. King killed? And they're like, oh, he was, he was trying to get voter rights or he was trying to fight for equality. And I was like, equality for whom? At this point in his life, it wasn't racial. It was about finances. It was about the economy. It was about the poor and the rich and the despair. And so we just don't know some of these things. And so I gravitate naturally to those types of stories that are on the fringe of you kind of think you know it or it's related to something you know. So like Barnstormers, yeah, you know about Jackie Robinson, but do you know about all Negro League Baseball and some of these great heroes who played the game? So that's how I am personally, um, that's, that's what, what I, I, I navigate towards. And that's what kind of pulls me in is thinking about the stories that are tangent, are, are, are parallel rather with some of these major things that are household names. And then after that, yes, it's the pitch. It's gone around. Who's, who's gonna fund this? Who's gonna to reach out? Um, I was able to get the Epic Games Mega Grant for Barnstormers and um, some smaller seats with some smaller groups. I'm still looking for a little bit to potentially bring it home to where I want it to be. Um, and, and, and honestly, the, the most challenging thing with, with Barnstormers right now is to really thinking through the headset development. I'm, I, I'm working twice as hard than I did with I Am A Man on this project because I'm constantly doing a build that I know will work on mobile and a build for, for Quest and a build that works for PC. And constantly, it's, it's, uh, that's exhausting. But it's, I know I need to do that for my dissemination plan. I want more people to see it. And so I don't want to bottle myself in a corner. So yeah, I'll have one version where the crowd is animated. I have another version where the crowd is still. Like I need to constantly think through every piece of the production that way. Yeah, yeah. Your your grasp on the um, the storytelling, the experiential side, but also like the the practical technical side, I really came through to me. I'm like, you have to when you have a, a small operation, especially an academic operation, you you have to carry more of that load, and like that was really inspiring. Seeing like you got a handle on both those things, so. It's just really cool seeing the stuff you're working on. Um, something that I didn't like share because audio doesn't play well across these lines is, um, so with I'm a Man, I spent a lot of time thinking about the tracks and the audio for every scene. There are some scenes I, that don't have audio and there's some cut scenes where it's a narrator. Um, with Barnstormers, I am going even deeper with music. And so it took me several months to finally settle on a full score. Um, I can't afford original score music for it, but I do have a budget enough to buy licenses to certain tracks I want to. 
So I have the full Barnstormers as a full album. <laughs> and it's about 25 minutes long. I listen to it religiously because as I'm listening to it, I'm seeing my VR project. I'm thinking yeah. through it and I'll, I'll, I'll like play it again. I'll play it again. So <laughs> that's a big part of me of like the arc and the emotional feel of the storytelling. Um, yeah, you I mean, you just touched on it. I mean, it was literally my question about I am a man uh, relating to that cut to black followed by the gunshot behind the player, um, which is really cool. I mean, that's really, yeah, it's, it's great. Um, I was wondering about like, what is the audio soundscape surrounding that moment? You know, like, so we have the, the audio of the gunshot and then like, what is the, what is the, the ambient land, the landscape like? So there's an audio track and I can't think of who this old jazz artist, but it's a blues song. It's a, it's old blues song. And he's, some of the lyrics are, if you have a strong brain, you have a strong mind, um, your life, uh, I don't know the, the line for line, but it's, it's a really good bluesy memphis -y type vibe. And it's just the guitar and the singer and his singing on it. And then there's some ambient, um, there's a truck that goes by. So you catch like a traffic of a truck kind of goes by and it's that kind of still evening and just that music being played, which is adds to the eeriness of it. Um, with Barnstormers, the thing that I'm most frustrated about is, and I didn't play baseball, but my, my son plays T-ball and I'll, and I'll watch it and I've gone to several games. Baseball sound is so unique and getting the bat hit I have not gotten the crack of the bat. There's plenty of files out there, but it doesn't sound right. And everyone, you're shaking your head because you're like, baseball, a very, so I'm still on the hunt to when you crack that hit, it has that unique, that reverbing uh, yeah. sound. Um, I might have to use our baseball team and go out there <laughs> with a mic and do several takes, but yeah, it's, it's, it's critical. And um you know, everyone wants to feel that. Like for, for me, you know, if you were building a, a basketball game, you would want to hear the swish sound, that, that your sports sound. So for me, if I'm going to make you and get you that moment where you get to hit one out the park, that crack doesn't sound perfectly. Like there's something about it, it's just off. And so, and I haven't played any VR experiences. I've played several sports ones, just testing them out. It's still, it's still open domain right there for someone to nail it. So I'm hoping- It's hoping part of the storytelling like you were talking about, right? Where it's like, whenever you hear, especially in baseball, when you hear that crack, you know exactly what's happening, right? So it's, it's, it's part of that holistic immersive storytelling experience. So that's, that's really cool to hear. And in your memory. It's, yeah, yeah, it's in yeah. Memory. I, I, I um, was fortunate enough to see Big Poppy when he was playing with the Boston yeah. Red Sox and saw him knock one out of Fenwick. And man, my memory is the hit and the roar of the crowd. Like that's what I yeah. that's what you gotta bring here. Yeah. You know? yeah. Oh, sorry, Brianna, wait, I, your hands up. Should I have, oh. Wait, wait, I have to add about that. The, the Dave, we've been talking about that um, for for the projects that we're working on. The the sound adds to the materiality, right? It's not it's it's not just the memory or the experience, but it actually creates a sense of physicality in the game. And I know when I first put on, put on the Oculus Quest, it was the ping pong ball, the sound of the ping pong ball dropping on the floor that just like did it for me. Like that was, that's what it was, right? Hitting the ping pong ball with the panel and hearing it the way it was supposed to sound. And to me, that's like a level of immersion that is just, it blows my mind still. So yeah, I mean, and, and I just have to repeat what everyone else said. This was an amazing presentation, so inspiring. Like your work is incredible. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Um, the, the glove catch was one that was a recent development that I, I love. I've, I've been in that space playing longer than I should because <laughs> I've worked with you. But the sensation of that and then the glove hits and you, and you feel a, a built-in haptics for it. So you get that and just throw it. Oh, it's so satisfying. But it's the subtlety of those audio moments, catching that, feeling it and, and everything. Um, yeah, I was going to say the sound of the glove is really good. Because like when it, just when you showed that clip, I'm like, I feel that. Like just listening to it, I feel that in my, in my hand. And that's that extra sense that people always accuse games of not having. 
Like sure, they're immersion, but you can't, you can't touch the world. Yet with sound, you kind of can. And I think that's really amazing. Now, it's just great that you're paying that, uh, paying that level of attention to it and recreating these past things. Because you got a couple archaeologists here. And so that's a really big deal. Like, can we start to get those past sounds to be senses? Because that just takes you a, another step in. So that's really cool. So Adam, I think you were going to ask something. Or maybe... No, no, no. Bree. Bree. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was going to ask with your projects, especially such an emotional project, like I am a man, um, how did you go about kind of the, I guess, alpha or beta testing to figure out if you really had the emotional experience that you wanted? Um, the museum is always, for me, the the key with, with projects. They, and I should say the historian, but for me, it was using the museum. So while I had my small circle and, and in North Carolina that could say, hey, test this, give me some feeling of it. For me, it really didn't pass the test until it was down in Memphis. Hey, I think I have close to the final build, you all. They actually helped me some rearrangement of some things. Um, with, with the same thing with Barnstormers, um, because I have the exclusive deal with the Negro League Baseball Museum, um, hopefully the summer COVID clears up, travels a little bit better. I'll be able to, towards the end, go back out to Kansas City and put museum staff in it because they're telling the story every day with their physical spaces. And so if they're going to, you know, say, no, that doesn't work or that music doesn't do good or mm, there's something historically incorrect on how you approach that part of it, I need them. And it's their stamp that's on it to do that. So that's how I always approach it. Will there be a day one day where um, I do a project um, that doesn't have that relationship? Probably not. If, if it's, if it's going to be historic related, I'm always going to go find, I need them on the team. Like it, they, they have to be there. They have to be that voice. Um, and I rely on that relationship. Um, yeah, I was um, thinking about my experience playing baseball as a kid and the way that, because we're talking about this baseball hit, um, and the way that particularly the, the bat itself would reverberate uh, when you would hit it. And I was wondering, like, um, have you done much with haptic feedback uh, in controllers? So I think it's yeah. a really interesting and in, in underutilized element, especially in VR. So there's a couple of things. Um, the haptics are, are always built in for me. Like when I, that glove hits, you know, the controller gives you that poof, that, that pulse. The challenging thing with the bat is not just the, the haptics in the bat, is what to do with it. And some of my early testers, they're, they're, they're split right now. There are some people who want to hit and run, like you saw, and there's some that just want to hit it and just sightsee and watch it. And all the diehard baseball people are like, well, coach will never tell you to sit and watch. You always <laughs> run and you toss just because you just don't know. And so this is like, it's the people who don't play baseball, like myself, who are like, I'm cool with just hitting and watching it. And it's like, well, what if it's infield and you haven't started running? So that's just this weird kind of like debate that's going on. Do you hit and run or do you hit and watch? Either or. Um, especially with the hitting and watching, you're right. How long does that stay? How long does that feel? That's, that's a challenge. I have not nailed it. Even, even holding the bat, even with the adapter, because the controllers are naturally feel different, it doesn't feel like a bat. So there's a lot of experimentation going on. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, yeah, to me, I think the, the Oculus Quest controllers in particular, like versus like the, so the Switch controllers, which are so cool because you can feel the there's like the, the mini game where you can feel the balls like little ball bearings sliding across your palm is so cool uh and then it seems like the oculus controllers are just kind of like they vibrate and and yeah especially something like a bat like i don't know it's it's really interesting. you uh, you mentioned um vader immortal several times and I don't know, I, I'm familiar with the game, but I haven't played it. Do, do they also have like the, the kind of connect that you talk about? Obviously it works better with like a lightsaber that doesn't have like the weight. There is that. none. There is none with it. As a matter of fact, when I, when I, when we developed it, we have, NC State has the patent on that controller adapter thing. Wow. I took it to a conference and was able to meet some of the IOMX people. And I was like, I told them, I was like, you know your commercials, you lie. 
Because every commercial, you hold the lightsaber like this a lot. And every video, people are just kind of like resting their hands like this. And they just kind of laugh. And they're like, yeah, we know. And then I gave them to them. And they are like, this is great. Like, this is what we need. So they, they have their like unofficial, without a, an official Disney brand, like thumbs up on that project. Because they're like, they, they all know that that's the issue. But you, but it's great to have one up on Disney. <laughs> but locking locking your hands in place is is a critical 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 component. You know, haptics in general are so underutilized, and there's just so much we can do with it. Um, I'll give you one one little tip, which is, and you could follow up with me if you want to learn a little bit about the project. Um, in my lab, we took an Xbox controller because it's already synced with PC and has haptics in it strapped it to the chest and started programming it for hit collisions on the body. We call it the rumble hack because literally just an ex a hack of an Xbox controller as a wearable and it works. It's so subtle. Things hit and you just Xbox controller just sh shakes on your chest. And we're like, that, what was that Xbox controller? 45 bucks? We have haptics now. Program. So <laughs> follow up with me if you want. Like, we, <laughs> we, we, we have full Unity kind of like scripts for it to like make it automatic it's like it's a no-brainer <laughs> weirdly enough i've actually That's been awesome. really really interested in, in haptic feedback vests recently and like custom building them so i might well do that yeah um that sounds really cool all right well man i can't even describe how much fun this has been uh so thank you so much for taking the time and uh again the generosity of kind of pulling back the curtain and looking into what you do and also your enthusiasm, passion for it, which is so clear. Um, so that's just been really incredible. So yeah, definitely a more than a golf clap Thank you <laughs> <laughs> for that. That was great. Thanks. Uh, so, and again, thanks to everyone who joined and I, uh, this is just a great closing for, for our event. So okay. awesome. Thanks everybody. Thanks for organizing Dave. Bye. For Dave. sure. Thank you so much. All right, see y'all.